going to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to continue the Sermon on the Mount, this concept. And in this uh, chapter, Jesus, again, is focusing on motives or intentions that we have. Asking you if you're good. I didn't really want to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Jesus is focusing on, on motives. And from a human perspective, we can only see what people do. From a divine perspective, from God's perspective, God can see why people do what they do. That's why we're... Uh, next Sunday we're going to look at chapter 7 and it opens this way. Don't judge. We can't judge because we can't judge intention. We can't judge motive. We can only judge behavior or activity. And oftentimes, people do things that, in our opinion, we say, man, that's, that's wrong. But they did it with the right motive. You say, I don't understand that. Well, let me tell you a story. There was a little boy, and he was helping his dad and work in the garden. And uh, dad was going through, and he was hoeing all the weeds out and uh, leaving the, the plants and he was and he didn't realize his son had gotten a little hoe and was following along behind getting all the ones dad missed and uh, when he got to the end of the road dad looked back and he's like son what did you do and he had cut down all the plants he said i i just was helping you daddy i was getting all the ones you missed <laughs> his intention yes good his action and eh, not so good you know created a real problem how can you punish that how can you discipline that when the child was had such a pure intention and motive. God knows the motives of our heart. And he's able to look at those things. And we can only see what people do. God sees why they do it. And he's going to talk about that in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, how many of you have prayed the Lord's Prayer before? Good, good. So at some point in your life, you have prayed words to this effect. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Everybody? You've prayed. What does that look like? How do we flesh that out? What would it look like if God's kingdom comes and His will is done on earth as it is in heaven? Now, I'm doing my best to re-preach Jesus' sermon on the mount where He's talking about His kingdom and how, what it looks like. But ideally, if you want to know what something looks like or something is supposed to look like, you talk to the person that created it. He is the founder of the church. He's the founder of his spiritual kingdom. And so we should listen to what Jesus has to say, even more than a pastor's words, listen to what Jesus has to say as he exposes us to this concept of his kingdom. I'm convinced that he can articulate it so much clearer than I. I'm just going to do my best to say what he says this morning and follow along with that. So let's just launch right in. You got to remember, I'm jumping into a sermon here that Jesus has already preached a chapter of, and we've, we've tried to walk through that with him. Now we're into, I guess, the second point, or for us, it's the third or fourth or fifth or sixth point of the outline. But uh, it's the first point of chapter 6, and that is it's a lesson on works. There are three assumptions that Jesus makes about our activities that are not listed as options for kingdom citizens, but expectations. These are some things Jesus said when you do these things, not if you do these things. There's a difference in if you're going to do something or when you're going to do it. Jesus says, I'm, I know this is going to happen if you're part of my kingdom. These things are going to take place. Three things. Number one, in verse number one, he launches right in. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, this is what citizen kingdomship looks like. When you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Or, in other words, don't make a big deal about it. That your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who's in season secret 
will himself reward you open, openly. So giving donations. Giving donations is an assumption that he makes. Can I tell you something? As a citizen of his kingdom, you don't pay taxes. You give charitable contributions. Okay? Now, there's an Old Testament concept of tithing. That was Jewish taxation. And they brought it to the temple because they had what was called a theocracy. It's not a democracy, it's a theocracy. God's in charge. And so you brought it to the church. We've translated that into the new uh, church as you got to pay your tithe. Well, let me, let me tell you, I, the, yes, 10% is a quota that God gives us for our income and what we should give. But listen to me. Don't do it out of a duty. I have to pay my tithe or God's going to hate me. No, no, no. Do it this way. I have the privilege this morning of giving my offering to the Lord because I'm a member of his kingdom and I love him. Amen? Doesn't that just kind of change things for you? You have the opportunity to invest in something that's far bigger than this universe can contain, and that is his kingdom. And we said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's telling us what it looks like. We give charitable contributions. Now, I don't know anything about your giving patterns here. I don't know anything about what you've been trained or taught to do. If I know Pastor Paul, he was faithful to teach you along the lines of biblical giving. Okay? But do it with a heart of passion. Secondly, an assumption that he makes is praying. In verse number 5 of chapter 6, Jesus says, And when you pray, not if you pray, you're going to pray. As a member of his kingdom, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. God honors praying when it's personal and it's private and it's a daily practice or more than once a day rather than a public performance. Now, that it's not, he's not saying it's wrong to ever pray in church. I just prayed for fits. There's nothing wrong with that. Corporately, together, believers praying. But let me tell you where the real power of prayer comes. It comes from praying in private or in secret. He said, when you pray, go into your closet or into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they'll, they'll be heard for their many words. And then Jesus gives us an example prayer. We'll get to that later on. But praying is an assumption that he makes on kingdom citizens. Here's a, here's a tough one. In verse 16, he makes another assumption after he teaches us how to pray. He makes this assumption. And you, when you fast, Oh, Lord. That's tough on a fat man to hear that verse. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was difficult. But he said, as a kingdom citizen, there will be times in your life when the burden will be greater than the appetite. And you will fast. And you will practice that as a part of your life. Jesus is not condemning any of these three religious activities. He's simply warning us about motives attached to them. Three attitudes to avoid in these areas when we're being kingdom people. First of all, in our giving, we are not to give so that men say, Wow, he gave. Not to be seen of men for sanctioning. What did Jesus say? That they may have glory from men in verse 2. That they may have glory from men when they gave. It's, it's awesome to give. It's awesome to give for grand purposes. It's awesome to give in public ways when it helps spurn and spawn giving from other people. I know there are times when churches do fundraisers and they provide... Um, public recognition for those who gave. I'm not saying, and Jesus is not saying there's anything wrong with that, except if the only reason you gave was to get the public recognition, there's no reward in heaven for that. Now, keep giving, 
But just don't look to get any reward in heaven for that, okay? Because he said they have the reward. The minute somebody says, wow, thank you so much, I just, and they give you all the glory, that's your reward. You got what you wanted. You were seen of men. Secondly, he said, when you pray, don't pray so that you can put on a show or to be seen of men. Verse 5, to be seen of men. Location and posture are unimportant. Motive is all important in our prayer. And prayer is something that we do in secret when our Father, who sees our secret time of prayer, rewards us open, openly. Now, here's what he's saying. Private prayer results in public reward. The things we pray about in our secret place is what God rewards openly. Here's what I fear, and I'm not going to be, I don't want to be critical, I don't want to be condemning. I just want to be honest. Here's what I fear about the church in 2019. Our prayers have become pompous and public. The only time we pray is when we're in a group and we don't spend quality time with God in private. You say, why do you say that, preacher? Because the Father who sees what we pray in private will reward us openly. And when our church and I'm not talking about this church. I know you're in a time of transition. If ever there was a time y'all need to be praying in private, right now is that time. Not, not for what you want. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. But if ever there was a time Church 180 needs to be praying in private, it's right now. Because we want to see God reward this waiting period, this praying period, openly when your new pastor arrives. Amen? Right now, you're transitioning. You're in a holding pattern. But every prayer that you pray in private, God will eventually reward you for openly. Now, if you just stand up here and pray, or you gather in a small group and you all hold hands and pray around in a circle, that's awesome, that's amazing, that's important to corporately pray. But the real reward for our prayers are those secret prayers. When we lock ourselves in and we... Call on his name. Fasting. That they may appear to men to be fasting. We're in the Lent season, right? Not, not pollen season. We're in that too, but I'm, I'm talking about Lent season. I'm, I'm talking about a time in the church when we sacrifice to get closer to God. We make personal commitments to God. So we can draw closer to Him. Many Christians still practice Lent. The discipline of fasting is never to be on display. Okay? If you're fasting, take a shower. I mean, that's what He says, you know? Don't come to church. What, what in the world's wrong with Him? I don't know, man. What, what's wrong with you? I've been, I've been fasting for our new pastor. Well, oh, brother, thank you so much. There's your reward. That's all you get. That's all you get is a pat on the back and a thank you for fasting. Jesus said, when you fast, this is something personal. Wash your face. Anoint your head. In other words... Fix yourself up. Don't come in here dragging and moping and groping and, and, and if your blood sugar's all out of whack because you've been fasting, don't come in here just showing off about that. Okay? Eat a peppermint for crying out loud. Get your blood sugar back to some normal measure and come in here and rejoice in the Lord. Fasting is for spiritual purposes and, and sometimes physical purposes. It has physical benefits for us, for our bodies. To each of these, Jesus says, there is a reward. Then that reward is earthly and very shortly lived. 
while kingdom people live with the constant understanding that I may not get the reward openly. Nobody may ever know what I gave. Nobody may ever know how many hours I spent in prayer. Nobody may ever know the days that I fasted and prayed during our time of transition or during a time of renewal spiritually for our church. They may never know. They don't need to know. God knows. And ultimately what we want is the response of God. We want His kingdom to come and His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, he says there are two assemblies, thirdly, to, to avoid being like. Number one, don't be like the heathen. What do heathen people do? According to Jesus in this passage, in verse number seven, he said, and when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Don't think if you say it louder, or if you say it more fervently, or if you say it over and 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 over again, you're going to earn God's attention anymore. Pray from a pure motive and a pure heart and seek His will and God will reward you. Don't be like the heathens. Avoid long, drawn out, repetitious prayers for the sake of length. Now, there will be times, ladies and gentlemen, when you're in the closet and you're praying and you're talking to God and time will slip away. I remember as a young Christian trying to develop a devotional life. Man, it was tough. I'd kneel down by my bed because I thought that's what you had to do to have a devotional life and I would kneel down and, and I would pray up one side of the family tree and down the other side. You know, I'd pray for everybody I knew to pray for. I'd pray for my pastor, my church. I'd pray for all the missionaries. I'd pray. And I'd look at the clock and I'd go, five minutes. What in the world? Whoever wrote that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, was a nut. I mean, you know, what in the world? I've been praying. I'm exhausted in prayer and I've been praying for five minutes. But as I've matured and grew in my relationship with God, there are times just when I'm in His presence, I don't say a word. But I come from that place having lost track of time, not knowing how long I was there. Hardly having said a word but I feel my strength renewed. That, ladies and gentlemen, is prayer. It's communion with God. Too many of us, too many of us view prayer as a monologue where we stand up and we tell God everything we want and need and all the people that need other stuff and, and then we're done. Real prayer involves dialogue. It involves me communing with God and then taking time for God to commune with me. Here's what happens the more you grow in your faith, the more you grow in your kingdom connection. Here's what happens. You become more like Him and in your like-mindedness you enjoy spending quality time together. A lesson on our works. Those three things. The second assembly is hypocrites. And again, motive is addressed in verses 2, 5, 16. Why do I do what I do? What I do is very important. But why I do what I do is even more important. If I do spiritual things to try to make you think that I'm spiritual and you say, man, he's spiritual. That's all I get. That's my reward. Now, y'all are not listening nearly quick enough, okay? Because we got a lot of waiting to do and you're going to you're gonna have to listen faster. That's all there is to it. I mean, I'm just... 
I'm scolding you, but it's my fault, right? You're trying. You're 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 more ready for lunch than I am. But you're like, come on, come on. We got a lot. Of, I know this little guy back here. He's like, we got so many notes to fill in. I'm never going to get to McDonald's. I'm just this is going to be struggling. <laughs> right, buddy. <laughs> A lesson on words and prayers. I'll run through this quickly because you've all prayed this before. This is an example prayer that Jesus teaches us in the middle of those assumptions. He stops long enough and he says, after this manner, pray. When we teach our children to pray, we teach them, now I lay me down to sleep. Right? I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die. Why do we do that to our kids? <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> If I should die before I wake and they start going, oh, I don't want to go to sleep. So no wonder your kids aren't sleeping at night. You just told them they might die. <laughs> if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Okay? Or, or we teach them, you know, uh, God is great. God is good. And we thank him for our food. Uh, who thought that rhyme? For our food. God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for our food. Listen, teach your children those prayers. Teach them to pray. Teach them to pray in a structured format. Okay? That's great. Because that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. Now, when your kids get over, older, there's going to be times they're going to pray for more than take my soul if I die tonight in my sleep. They're going to pray for more than thank you for the food. Okay? Our prayers are going to expand. This is the example prayer. This is the pattern. Like when you go to grade school and they teach you 1 plus 1 equals 2. 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm going to stop right there because I may embarrass myself. I go real high there. Now, freak me out. I was in middle school. This is way back when algebra didn't start when you were like in third grade. You know, this is... Like algebra didn't start till you were a freshman in high school. That's how old I am. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm learning all this stuff, and I get up there, and I get to a freshman, and I go to the high, to high school campus, and I open my algebra book. I thought I had it. Now all of a sudden they're, they're adding numbers and letters together, and I, I don't have any clue how to do numbers and letters together. The problems change, but because of the basic 1 plus 1 equals 2, I was able to grasp algebra and add letters and numbers. The problems in your life are going to change, but after this manner, pray. Do it, do it like this. Are you ready? Real quick. Number one, establish the relationship. He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Be sure that you're a child of God. That's where it all starts. Prayer starts with a connection, a relational connection to God. God, I want you as my, my God, I want you to be my Savior, and I want you to be my Lord. And I want to have that relationship intact. Our Father which art in heaven. Secondly, exalt the receiver. Hallowed be thy name. You're sovereign. Okay? Your name is above every name. And then, before you ask God for anything, you, you give Him praise. And then you can ask. Okay? Express the request. Don't beg. Just make your request known to God. Okay? With thanksgiving. Four things. Give us, that's daily provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive our debts, as we forgive our debtors or trespasses, whichever word you choose to use. Daily pardon. <coughs> Lead us daily pathways. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. How? By leading us away from. Deliver us from evil. Daily protection. Did you get those? Four things he said you should ask for. Your needs. Your daily provision needs. For forgiveness where you failed. Lead us for leadership. And deliverance from evil. Daily protection. And then... Edify the ruler. So you've exalted the receiver of your prayer. You edify the ruler. Here's what he's saying. Two parts praise, one part petition. Okay? Make sure you spend a lot of time in your prayer time thanking God. Somebody said, don't ask God for another blessing until you've sent him a receipt for the last one. Make sense? 
Be sure you thank God. I promise you, you'll grow a lot better in your relationship with God when you spend time praising Him than you do when you spend time begging Him for stuff. Okay? He, he's not your Santa Claus. He's your Father. Sometimes He's going to say no when you ask. You got that, right? Everybody, anybody believe that? Yeah? Don't you hate when God says no? But God, I really need that new motorcycle. <laughs> no. <laughs> but Lord, you can help me win that lottery. I mean, it's, you know. He... No. How about if I just get you a job? Oh. Lord, are you serious? <laughs> I was hoping that wasn't the way it was going to go here. He's not interested in just coddling you. He's interested in making you like him. That happens through prayer if we grow close to Him. And, if I, and then thirdly, a big word just for the sake of the alliteration, but end with relinquishment. In other words, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You know what the word amen means? So be it. Just, okay. So be it. I surrender. You're in charge. Say amen. Saying amen is a fresh surrender of my will to God's will. It's saying yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. Amen. Sealed, with, sealed the deal right there with an amen. Now, you did a good job listening fast there. Let's go. Point number three. Jesus continuing through this, and he's going to talk about money. Everybody likes to talk about money, right? Well, if you're in his kingdom, he's got some concepts that go along with finances. Okay? A lesson on wealth. Do not hoard up treasures on earth. Verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth nor rust can destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't lay or don't hoard. Now again, don't stockpile so much that money's not evil. Let me, let me just say that very quickly. Money's not evil. But the love of money leads to all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root, the Bible says, of all kinds of evil. And it's so true. Don't hoard it up. Do lay them up in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. Now it's hard for me to fathom that anything on earth would be of value in heaven. Right? I mean, up there... Gold isn't all that significant. They paved, they paved the streets with it. Pearls? Oh, amazing for us. We love pearls. You know what they do with them? Up? They make gates out of them up there. Jasper? Yeah, it's drywall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Jesus doesn't consider all of our gold and all of those things as the most valuable things in our lives. But he does say, store up your treasures in heaven. He's not preaching against you having money. He's preaching against you and me using our money for vain and empty purposes. If what I'm doing with my finances does not bring glory to his name and help build his kingdom, I'm, I'm misusing his blessing. Let her see. What we work for shows what we have our heart set on. Verse 21, did you read that? Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We get this backwards. We want to pour money into the things that we love. Jesus said, I want you to pour money into things that I want you to love. I want you to pour your treasure into the thing. And if you pour your treasure into something, your heart will be there. <clears throat> right? You support Church 180, you'll be here. Your heart will be here. You'll love this place when you start giving. Our treasure, or our heart, always follows our treasure. It always does. <laughs> I have some friends. <clears throat> they... Um, they were die-hard South Carolina fans. Any of those here? Gamecocks? Yep. And then their boy 
decided to go to Clemson to get an engineering degree. Woo! Well, we got a couple tigers here. You're going to love this story then. It was amazing when mom and dad started pouring money into Clemson. How quickly they got rid of all their garnet colored t-shirts and went and bought orange or purple ones. Why? Because that's where the money goes. And you ask them, I thought you used to be a Carolina fan. I think I've given too much money to Clemson. I gotta love Clemson. I gotta cheer for Clemson. You know what I'm talking about. Wherever you put your treasure, your heart will follow it. Jesus said, put your treasure into the things that pertain to my kingdom. The lamp of the body is the eye, verses 22 and 23. This is dealing with our spiritual focus. Stay focused on the king and his kingdom. Here's, this is important, verse 24. What we love, we eventually will serve. What we make high priority in our life will, if we're not guarded, will soon become our God and usurp the throne of our heart away from the king of this kingdom. He said, Mammon, you can't serve more than one thing. You can't serve two masters. Either you hate the one, love the other, or else you be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or materialism. Mammon is just another word for money. So this whole lesson is a lesson on our wealth. You can't serve money and the master of all. You can't. He's not saying you can't have money. He's saying you can't serve money. Money has to be your servant and you are his servant. Right? I heard a man say, you know, I quoted the verse, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I heard a man, Richard S. Taylor, one time said, he said, it's as possible to have money and not love it as it is to love money and not have it. We look at rich people and go, they just love money. No, they probably give a whole lot more away than we do. And God just keeps blessing. I have a friend. He was actually a board chairman of mine when I was pastored. He took me out to breakfast one Saturday morning, me and another guy, or actually it was a Wednesday morning. And um, we went to a buffet. He set us up. We went to a buffet breakfast and had bacon and grits and eggs and... Biscuits and gravy, and I mean, it was just, uh, yeah, we loaded it up. And then we sat down, and he said, you know what? We're fat. I said, man, I'm your pastor, don't talk to me that way. You know, you know he's like, he was a little more gentle. But he, he, had a, he was a businessman, had a, a nice income. He said, I'm concerned about us. And he said, I want to challenge you men to we're going to lose weight and we're going to try to get healthier he paid for us to go to Weight Watchers together guys if you ever get a good chance to go to Weight Watchers pass on that <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you it's, it's a great plan but it, it's, an, it's, it's pretty much a known fact men can drop weight quicker than women. And it's like, it's like group therapy for women. I starved all week, I gained three pounds, you know, there, there. and here I am, I feel guilty because, you know, I, I went ahead and ate. But of course, when you're on Weight Watchers, I had so many points, I was giving points away. I was like, dude, you want a brownie or something? I mean, I got extra points to go around here. I'm not, I'm not hungry and you can have extra points of mine. We were able together, collectively, to lose a medium-sized child. I mean, we, we, 150 pounds, 162 pounds we lost collectively in about six or seven months. He paid for all of our... Not only that, but on top of that, he said, I'm going to give each person who loses 50 pounds $1,000. 
And I'm going to give an additional $1,000 to the person who loses the most, over 50 pounds. Well, he kept that. He lost the most. He lost 62. But I got my $1,000. I lost 56 pounds. You can tell I've worked very hard to keep that off. Why are you laughing? <laughs> keep waiting for the guy to call me back up and take me to breakfast. You know what I'm saying? He's a wealthy man. Very wealthy man. But he's not in love with his money. He's in love with the king of the kingdom and he uses his financial status to advance the kingdom. Let me just give you a little side note to that. He lost 62 pounds. We finished in October of that year. September, October of that year. And in January, he had a massive heart attack and would have died had he not lost 62 pounds before that. He stayed in ICU for eight days, and the doctor told him, you know, you're fortunate you dropped that weight because that helped you make it through that heart attack. Wow. God just said, put your, put your money here. And he did it out of a generous love for his pastor. I think he was a whole lot more concerned about me than he was about himself, but... He knew to motivate me. He needed to work. And he did. And I love the man today. I still love the man. He, I don't attend the same church any longer. And I'm no longer his pastor. But I love him. He's a kingdom man. Wouldn't it be awesome if people talked about you and me and said, you know, he's a kingdom guy. She's a kingdom lady. They just live for the kingdom. Doesn't happen. We're not doing it to get their oohs and their ahs and those words of kindness. We live for the kingdom because we're in love with the king. But when you live for the king, kingdom and you love the king, people recognize there's something different about that. What we love, eventually we will serve. Can we do one more? Number four. Let's get through this, all right? Between verses 25 and 34, the end of this chapter, Jesus uses the word worry six times. Following up this lesson on finances, Jesus basically tells us this is more about your faith than it is your finances. This is more about your relationship to the king than it is about your money. It's not a plea for bad management and throwing your money away. You should save for retirement. If Jesus were preaching here this morning, he would tell you, you should save for retirement. Everybody who is here who is retired would tell you this morning, you need to save for retirement. That's just the way it is. It's the culture that we live in. But make sure that your money serves you and you serve Jesus. A lesson on worry. He begins in verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, uh, don't worry about your body, what you're going to put on, what your clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are, are you not of more value than they? I'm, I'm going to answer that question. You are. You are. Let me give you several things here. Number one, worry cannot change any of our circumstances. Jesus said, which one of you by worry can add an hour to your life? None of us. Probably take a few hours away if you worry. But you don't add any time. 
Worry can't change our circumstances. You've seen the bumper sticker on a car. What changes things? Maybe you haven't seen the bumper sticker on the car. <laughs> I'm nuts, okay. Let me just tell you what it says. Prayer changes things. Anybody ever see that? Is God not allowed in Rock Hill? What in the world? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Prayer changes things. How many have remotely heard that at some point in your life vaguely, conceptually, you've got that luck? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Here's the way most of us live. Worry changes things. But it doesn't. Worry doesn't change one thing except make your blood pressure high. It really doesn't change anything. Paul told the Philippians, don't worry about or be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. Here's where the peace of God kicks in. When you choose not to worry, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ. Don't worry. Pray. Pray. With thanksgiving. Now me telling you not to worry is like me trying to teach you algebra. You already know where I'm at on that whole thing. Worry is a, a constant temptation for all of us. Because life is full of things that create fear. Okay? But let's go to the second point. Worry is spiritually, physically, and emotionally damaging to your temple. Worry will kill you. Worry will cause us to lack productivity in our lives. Medical science says that worry can contribute to ulcers, headaches, heart attacks, stroke, blood, pressure fluctuation, easy for you to say, blood pressure fluctuation, depression, and even suicide can be caused by worry. <laughs> I had a lady come up to me one time. I'm pastoring this lady. I've been her pastor for a number of years. Her son is reaching those late teenage years and she's very concerned. She comes up to me and she says, Pastor, do you think I should worry about Danny? And she started listing all the things that could happen. You know, like if, if the stars aligned, the planets aligned, Earth lost its gravitation. I mean, it was, like, it was like this chaotic circumstance that she, what if he does this and this and this and this? And this? I said, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, go ahead and worry. You should probably just stroke out right now. You should probably just pass out on the floor and have a stroke. That's the thing to do. I said, first of all, why would you worry when you predicated everything on if he does this and this and this, and if he does this and this, and if he does this and this, and if he does this and this. I said, you've trained him not to do those things. You've trained him to walk with God. You've taught him. You've lived the life before him, and you've taught him every day. I've been his pastor, and I'm relationally involved in this kid's life. I promise you he's not going to do those things. Stop worrying. Trust the training. Trust the Lord who helped you to train him. Oh, yeah. You know? Somehow, real? I shouldn't worry about it? Shouldn't worry. Worry is a negative statement about God's ability to care for you. Somebody said, cursing takes God's name in vain. Worry takes God's character in vain. Worry is what we do when we don't trust. Now we tamper with the title. We do this. I'm not worried. I'm just concerned. <laughs> okay. Then how come your ears are red? Uh, you just, you know, how come your blood pressure is so high? We worry. Do you know the Bible? I, I may have shared this with you before, but I share this with a lot of hospice patients. The Bible says more than any other thing, any other command, don't be afraid. Worry is a result of fear. And more often than anything else, the Bible says, do not fear. Why? Because it's the greatest tendency of the human heart is to fear the unknown, to fear the future, to fear tomorrow, to fear my next doctor's appointment, to fear, we, we fear so many things. 
Somebody counted them, I didn't do it. Somebody counted them and said it says it 365 times, don't be afraid. That's one for every day of the year. Why? Because you're tempted to be afraid every day. Every day there's a possibility that you can be tempted, but you don't have to. You don't have to worry. You can trust Him. Number four. Worry will not solve any of today's problems nor tomorrow's perplexities. Somebody said worry is like a rocking chair. It doesn't get you anywhere, but it gives you something to do. <laughs> Somebody else said worry really does work because 90% of the things that you worry about never end up happening. Isn't that true? Here's the tough one, guys. And I'm going to close with this. Contrary to popular opinion, worry is sin. It is a sin. God tells us over and over and over again, don't worry. Now, you say, oh man, I've worried this week. I guess I've sinned. God doesn't love me anymore. Listen, when you sin, it doesn't mean God doesn't love you anymore. It means you stop trusting Him for a little while. Okay? When you realize you've sinned, what are you supposed to do? Throw up your hands, quit, crawl off in a ditch, cry? No. God, I'm sorry. I wasn't trusting. Renew my faith. Help me not to worry. Help me to trust. There was a man who came to Jesus and had a child who had a, a physical ailment. Had seizures, basically. And he asked Jesus to heal and Jesus said, well, I can if you believe. This was the man's response. I do believe. Help my unbelief. God, I do trust you. Help me to trust you. Isn't that a good prayer? We're blessed this morning to be a part of his kingdom. And when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, this is kind of what it looks like in our lives. And he has an answer. He has a, he has a topic that he'd like to discuss with all of us ongoingly for how his kingdom is supposed to look in my life. Can you say from your heart this morning, your kingdom come, your will be done? Can you for Church 180 say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Would you bow with me? God, it's so easy in this world for us to lose focus on how awesome you are. We tend to try to do things ourselves and fix it all. We tend to trust in us. 